Good evening. My name is Fia Lemos. I'm the Associate Curator of Public Programs at Ribalca 2 and Suddenly It All Blossoms. And it's my pleasure welcoming you to our online series of talks and conversations this week dedicated to re-articulating what it means to be human. Is the world as we know it the only possibility for living? Is there only one way of being human, of thinking humanity? I'd like to introduce our speaker today with a quote from the Zapatista Declaration of 1996. And I quote, Many worlds are walked in the world. Many worlds are made. Many worlds make us. There are words and worlds that are lies and injustices. There are words and worlds that are truthful and true. In the world of the powerful, there is only room for the big and for their helpers. In the world we want, everybody fits. The world we want is a world in which many worlds fit. I'm pleased to introduce Professor of Anthropology, Science and Technology Studies, Marisol de la Cadena, whose visions on the plurality of life worlds have long been an important inspiration. Marisol has kindly sent us a recording of her talk, which will follow, and will reconvene for a short discussion at the end. Thank you for tuning in. Hello, thank you for inviting me to this talk, uh, the title of which is Runa, Human, But Not Only. As I um, develop my talk, you will understand better what the word runa means. Uh, but um, in a nutshell, it is the word with which uh, people in the Andes call themselves. Um, okay, so I'll start my talk with an anecdote. I once told a customs agent who was quizzing me about the purpose of my presence in the UK that I was there to talk about mountains that were not only such. A bit taken aback, but also trying to show that he understood, he asked, sacred mountains? And I responded cryptically, that too, but again, not only such. He smirked, sealed my passport, and I left giggling silently. An inconspicuous, if frequent, phrase I learned to use not only as ethnographic conceptual tool in conversation with Mariano and Nazario Turbo. They would insist that what to me was, for example, a mountain was not only that. In coming to terms with what was not only what to me was, in addition to taking time, required working at a permanent interface a mutually inhabited relation with the Turbos world in practices and mine were both seemingly alike and at the same time very different. And what emerged at the interface rather than the entity or practice in question was the awareness of our concepts and ways, the Turbos and mine always exceeding each other as they also overlapped, relationally mutually other and not only, relentlessly so. In what follows, I'll offer you the explanation that I left the customs agents without. And although I go into the 16th century momentarily and in speculative mode, I promise to connect it back with the ethnographic moment when I thought sacred mountains, but not only. On to the 16th century then. It is impossible to take from them the superstition because the destruction of these wakas would require more force than that of all people in Peru in order to move these stones and hills. This quote by Cristóbal de Albornoz belongs to the process I'm calling the Anthropo-Nod Scene. A condition of possibility for the Anthropocene, I conceptualize the Anthropo-Nod Scene as a world-making process by which heterogeneous worlds that did not make themselves through the division between humans and non-humans, nor necessarily conceived as such the different entities in their assemblages, were both obliged into that distinction and exceeded it. The anthropoid scene was the process of destruction of these worlds and the impossibility of such destruction. So the anthropoid scene was both the destruction of the worlds that exceeded what they were not supposed that what they were supposed to be and the impossibility of that destruction 
The anthroponym scene includes the practices and practitioners of the will that granted itself the power to eradicate all that disobeyed the mandates to be human as modernity in its early and late versions sanctioned, and the disobedient practitioners of collectives composed with entities recalcitrant to classification as either human or not human. So the Anthropocene, the Anthropocene scene is far more complex than, than the Anthropocene, for it includes, as I said before, the will to destruction uh, of entities that disobeyed the mandates that were ordering them what to be, and the practices and practitioners that disobeyed what they were ordered to be. It is a very complex relation. It is, the Anthropocene scene is a relation of antagonism into what should be and what doesn't want to be what it should be and therefore is not while being. Very complex condition. Initial obvious makers of the Anthropocene scene were people like Cristóbal de Albornoz, a friar well known after his activities to extirpate idolatries, one of the practices from which the new world emerged as inhabited by redeemable humans and nature, all God creations. Earth beings is my translation for huacas, the entities the Albornoz wanted to destroy. I met them as Tiracuna. The word Tiracuna is composed of the Spanish tierra, and it's Quechua pluralization, cuna. So tira, T-I-R-A, stands for tierra, T-I-E-R-R-A. It is, tira is the Quechua pronunciation of the Spanish tierra. So tierras, or earths, would be a literal translation for tiracuna. Intriguingly, the Albornoz translated huacas as stones and hills, and identify their, their enormousness as the cause of the difficulty to eradicate what he considered a relationship of false beliefs. The extirpator's surprise and anxiety did not end with the enormity of the idols, for he also found out that people, while different from huacas, what the Almornos called hills and stones, were also in continuity with them and could even become one. I want us to take this surprise into consideration for the possibility of becoming waka, translated by the colonial friars and contemporary scholars as becoming rock, speaks of the divergence between Spanish human and Andean people or runacuna in spite of their also apparently apparent similarity. So risking anachronism for the sake of a thought exercise, in addition to replacing allegedly spurious beliefs with legitimate ones, the 16th century practice of extirpating idolatries might have included displacing the relational possibility of Andean people or Runacuna becoming with Wakas with a theological relational grammar that conceived of humans as distinct from nature. The friar's mission might have required making the, the human that conversion needed, and this human was not what the friars encountered, for Runacuna could become with Tiracuna. The colonial expansion denied humanity to its other. That is the usual assumption. But what if this were not only the case? The famous mid-16th century debate in Valladolid, let's remember, did not cast doubts about the humanity of New Worlders. The discussion was about the kind of humans Indians were and the kind of treatment that would best suit Spanish moral and economic interests as they converted them to Christianity. Neither of the two most prominent contenders, Sepúlveda or Las Casas, doubted Indians had souls. Rather, it was their having souls that made them potential praise of the devil. Defeating the danger required the eradication of Indians' idolatrous practices, including, of course, their becoming Waka. 
in what can be a retrospective insight on what I have just said. And as he wraps his The Order of Things, Foucault writes, and I quote, taking a relatively short chronological sample within a restricted geographical area, European culture, since the 16th century, one can be certain that man, that man is a recent invention within it. End of quote. Agreeing and expanding Foucault's Europe to its recently conquered territories, my proposal is that in the Andes, the emergence of man, with capital M, might have implied a colonial imposition, not the denial of Christian humanity on Runa Kuna, that entail extirpating not the idols alone, but with them forms of personhood that could be continuous with wakas. Disobedient persons, or humans, whose continuity with stones was enabled by the devil, were persecuted and condemned to jail, death, and hell. The practice, not surprisingly, coincided with a critical period of persecution of witches and so-called werewolves in Europe, perhaps also Christian human-making practices. Befuddling the friars, the Andean disobedience, Runa Kuna, with Tiracuna, continued, if also changing historically. Today, 500 years after Cristóbal de Albornoz, earth beings confront new eradicators. Mining corporations, agents of the Anthropocene, translate Tiracuna as mountains and a source of minerals and therefore wealth. Unlike their colonial counterparts, they have the power to remove mountains, redirect rivers, or empty lakes. In earlier work, in an article that I published in 2010, uh, that was called Indigenous Cosmopolitics, Conceptual Reflections Beyond Politics, I explained that protesting these extractive practices, earth beings have broken into the public political scene as, and I quote myself, contentious objects whose, whose mode of presentation is not homogenous with the ordinary mode of existence of the objects thereby identified. End of quote. Of my quote, earth beings as actors in the public sphere shock the anthropistemic lim limits of politics, a scandalous presence, they need to be trivialized, mocked at. I stayed faithful to what I then said. However, today, I would also extend the being contentious to the runacuna with whom Turacuna, Tiracuna are made public. They, runacuna, Andean people, are also not homogenous with the ordinary mode of existence attributed to humans. They are contentious to it. For in IU, a y -double -L -U, they emerge inherently with Tiracuna. The Andean ethnographic record is replete with references to IU. And it is defined in the Andean uh, ethnographic record as the collective possession of land by a group of humans linked by kinship bonds. Collective possession of land by a group of humans linked by kinship bonds. Obeying the grammar of conversion, Ayu here has three distinct actors, humans, land, and the relationship between them. I say that Ayu is this institution and not only. Thinking with disobedient grammars, Ayu is also a relation through which Tiracuna with Runacuna take place. That is, they become in time and space as a complex entity, a more than one, less than many composition, inherent to which is the relation that enables it. As Donna Haraway says, it is important what relations think relations that think entities. And she takes this phrase from Marilyn Strathern. And now I want to say what I had not said in my earlier work. Runacuna are contentious because as they become with earth beings in the public political sphere, they are human and not only. Being inherently with earth beings, When they appear in politics, their composition is 
not only that of humans representing mountains. Contentiously, they make presents the disobedience Christianity declared could not be the Anthropocene, the human with that which the person so called human could not be. I firmly believe that we have never been human, let alone man. This is a phrase in the introduction to the Donna Haraway Reader. Actually, the title is The Haraway Reader. It is also the title of the first section of When Species Need. Others have discussed similar ideas. For example, in 2011, Dorian Sagan delivered a talk at the AAA uh, with the title The Human is more than human, and the AAA is the American Anthropological Association. My title uh, for this talk, Luna, Human But Not Only, is Fellow Travelers of Donna's and Sagan's Ideas. And I repeat, my title for this talk is Luna, Luna Human But Not Only, and Sagan's title is The Human is More Than Human, and uh, Donna, Donna's phrase, Uh, or sentence uh, said, I firmly believe that we have never been human, let alone man. So there is a resonance among all three sentences. So my, my title is Fellow Traveler of Their Ideas. It bears similarities with Haraway's and Sagan's title, yet my pro purpose is also other. For example, the human that Sagan's work evokes is, like in the usual definition, of IU, the ethnographic definition of IU that's seen in every Andeanist uh, book, um, the human that uh, Sagan's invoke is similar to that uh, ethnographic definition of IU. Uh, that human is the one that's relationally separated from or brought together with the non-humans that he also evokes. So what Sagan and Donna are saying is we are we have never been human because we have always been as humans related to something else. And I'm saying something similar, but not exactly that the same. Runacuna and Tiracuna are not only this human and non-human. And the, there is a, I want to make a caveat to avoid being mis mis misunderstood. I'm not saying that Sagan or Donna are wrong. My purpose is not to correct their statements. Rather, it is to contrast and genealogically connect the more than human or the non-human of those titles with their excess. The disobedient Tiracuna with Runacuna, whose joint personhood is enabled in a way that geology and biology respectively do not exhaust. So the difference between uh, what I'm saying, in spite of the similarities and the overlaps, is that runacuna with tiracuna are not explained through biology and geology. And Sagan's work and Donna's work is biological. They, they, they think through biology. And runacuna and tiracuna, who have also never been neither only human or non-human, are not biology or geology in this case. I first thought human, but not only, when requested to write a comment to How Forests Think, Eduardo Conte's very inspiring book. A passage in that book slowed down usual understandings of human and non-human. It really slowed down understandings of humans and non-human. And we have not paid too much attention to that. Well, um, and I, I, I was, my attention was called uh, to that sentence. So, Um, Eduardo Con writes, Runa, the people uh, with whom he worked, understand human and non-human sociality as one and the same thing. Hmm. I'm going to reread it. Runa, understand human and non-human sociality as one and the same thing. That sentence already is imploding human and non-human in their separation. And also, they're on to composition because they are thought as one and the same thing. Confirming my need to slow down the notions of human and non-human was the condition that Khan described whereby Aruna, 
that is a person that we would call human, could be with Jaguar. And the phrase in, in Khan's book is pumayo. And the suffix y-u indicates with, with. Puma is Jaguar. Pumayo is with Jaguar. Uh, so the phrase is Pumayo. Um, and if uh, humans could be with Jaguars, Jaguars could also be with persons. So that's the indifference between human and non-human sociality. So this is already telling me about these people are not humans like we are. And these jaguars are not just animals, like in our notions of animals, and neither are our notions of species. So, uh, and Khan also wrote, where jaguars, runa puma, or runa persons are also dogs. Where jaguars here is like werewolves, where jaguars. So the, the, that is the jaguar with person. I'm going to repeat the phrase. Where jaguars, runa puma, or runa persons are also dogs. And he called all these conditions transspecies pigeons, which I agree they are, but not only. I insist in the not only, because I rep I I think it and I repeat it matters what concepts think concepts and where worlds meet. Species may need to open up to partial connections with entities whose relational becoming is not only as species, at least not in their biological version. No matter how complex and non-linear that version might be. Next to the sentence by Donna Haraway that I read before, she writes, quote, in my view, people are human in at least one important sense. We are members of a biological species, Homo sapiens. That puts it solidly inside history, science, and nature, right at the heart of things. Tweaking it to my intentions, Haraway's sentence may also up to open up to excesses of science, history, and nature, and thus to other than Homo sapiens ways of being or gente in Spanish. The indistinction between human and non-human sociality suggested by Pumayo, the composition Runa with Jaguar, or in the story I tell, Earth beings with Luna Kuna may also suggest that those entities are not only human and non-human in the Christian or biological versions. Another example, David Copenawa, famous Yanomami shaman and Brazilian politician, in his recent book, die, writes, Today, we are the same kind as those we give the name of game. Our inner part is identical to that of game. We only attribute ourself, to ourselves the name of human beings by pretending to be so. Animals consider us their fellow creatures who live in house while there are people of the forest. This is what they say. Humans are the game that live in houses. That's in David Copenawas and Bruce Albert's book. These are neither isolated examples nor restricted to the Andes, Andes or Amazonia. Rane Villerslev, an ethnography of Siberia, in an article suggestively titled Not Animal, Not Not Animal, explains that the Yukahir hunter, and Yukahir is the group of people he worked with, the Yukahir hunter, usually man, seduces his would-be prey, let's say an elk, by becoming it. But he becomes it in becomes an elk incompletely so to maintain sight of his own personhood and thus avoid becoming irre irreversibly the elk he is after. Caveats once again. First, I'm not saying, not talking about a pan-indigenous human capacity to actually become animal. Rather, what I'm trying to do is to rethink the relational conditions that make those notions, human and animal, distinct and the embodied grammar that those conditions enforce to propose that while currently hegemonic, they were also created as part of a universal order 
that was not only obeyed. Second, and rather obvious, the Turpos, the Runa people that Khan worked with, the Siberian Yuka here, and Davi Kopenawa are not saying or doing the same thing. Yet, they all disobey human, animal, plant, taxonomic distinctions, and exceed society thus made while also being part of it. So what I'm talking about is the way in which there are worlding practices that exceed what we know and are as human and non-human while at the same time also being human and practicing taxonomic practices that separate um, taxonomic classifications that separate between human and plants and rivers and mountains and animals, etc. But not only. So I'm talking about this complex entity that the Anthropocene is. The will to eradicate and the impossibility of eradication. The human with Jaguar Pumayo, the hunter that needs to remember he's not the elk that would be his prey, or the human as the game that lives in houses, are both the we that has never been human because it has always been an inter or intra species relationship, and not only that we. So it's the we that has been the human and non human that Donna Haraway and Dorian Sagan and others talk about. And not only that we. It may be this capacity to exceed society, to be unoccupied by it while occupying it, even if at the margins that makes Runa Kuna and others like them effectively, and that is politically, I mean it politically, promising, impossible to society, yet dwelling within it and also beyond its limits, they are powerfully frightening because if we accept the challenge, to think in the presence of those excesses of that human but not only, they can offer possibility for I, what I call ontopistemic openings. And in a nutshell, uh, about ontopistemic openings, uh, and I cannot explain this longer here because there's no time, uh, on, by ontopistemic openings, I mean undoing the closures that make the given, for example, the human, as given, to consider it a historical event in Foucault's sense, the human as a historical event, not man, the human as historical event, and open possibilities for what this event that would then replace what is what was given might not contain, while also being part of it. Not only the event human, mountain, animals as biology or geology, also its successes. So I'm saying let's consider human, mountain, animals, biology, geology as events and not only to be able to think also about its successes. That which is not within human, animal, mountain as the historical event that we are used to, but exceeds that historical event, has been in, made impossible to be, yet is. To talk about Runakuna as not only humans is disturbing. I can feel it. Anti-colonial anxiety haunts the idea and prevents further thought. Questioning the universality of nature to proceed with multiculturalism and provincialize non-humans is much easier than proposing an analogous conceptual move for humanity that avoids culture. But in the spirit of the absolutely gargantuan task of decolonizing thought, absolutely gargantuan task, I propose a question. Could the egalitarianism intimated in the unqualified equivalence between human and runa or other forms of being person 
also carry, could it carry could that unqualified egalitarianism could also carry the legacy of a colonial vocation that granted itself universal power to offer the human safe haven, sacred and also secular via universal rights, while banishing forms of personhood that this vocation, this universal vocation, could not recognize? The Anthropocene is a way of taking, of talking of those forms of personhood. Not the invisible subaltern human, mind you, I'm not talking about that, but the disobedient compound person with that it could not be with. Human, but not only. The Yukahir hunter that is not animal and not not animal. The elk that's not only animal because it could also be the hunter. The Anthropocene is a neologism that uses the opportunity of extractivist neoliberalism and the presence it has generated in Indian politics of unrecognizable beings to provincialize the human and to uncommon nature what, while also reckoning uh, with a history that makes both human and nature globally hegemonic. Not only, and also the Anthropocene and uncommon in nature or the uncommons, are fellow travelers of what Marilyn Strathern has called negativities. That mode of analysis she used to take into consideration the absence, in Hagen, her fieldwork side, of certain categories and then use such categorical absence to affect her analysis by, I quote her, creating contrast with inner language. And I end her quote. Absences, she said, I quote again, create spaces that our analysis lacks and can be used to stop ourselves thinking about the world in certain ways. Similarly, I use absences to affect our conceptual language, but I also wish to do something else, perhaps more prosaic. My use of negativities, and particularly not only, wants to indicate that epistemic assertions that make presences, for example, nature and culture, uh, may, and the conditional uh, is in very important here, may include the ontological denial, sometimes benevolent, yet always imperative, of what exceeds them. Autopistemic assertions, let's say nature, can make absent and impossible what does not fit them, while also creating room to tolerate those excesses, to tolerate them. Once again, the historical moment is important here. Nature and humans are not absent from IU, yet in extractivist corporate territory, their imperative assertion by the state, the police, mining companies, makes impossible all that exceeds nature and humans and the relation that separates them. In the best of cases, that excess is made tolerable as cultural belief, a reality of second order, usually ignored, but as of lately, also extirpated via its criminalization. I will give you an example of the assertive will of an ex-Peruvian president to make impossible what does not fit within nature. Exasperated in front of TV cameras, he yelled out. We have to defeat those absurd pantheistic ideologies that believe mountains are gods and the wind is gone. To believe that means to return to those primitive forms of religiosity that say, do not touch that mountain because it's a Napu. Apu means a powerful earth being uh, in Quechua and uh, all of us in the Andes know what an apple means. It's an apple full of millenarian spirit or whatever. Okay, if we get there, we'd rather not do anything, not even mining. This was the ex-president of Peru, Alan Garcia, in 2011. While speaking modern in the idioms that separate the sacred and the secular, the ex-president's words have uncanny resonance with the 16th century extirpation of idolatries that the Albornoz practiced. A difference that the colonial friar might be jealous of is that extractivist corporations can actually remove the object of superstition. Another difference, and this one the Albornoz might not have liked, is that current extirpators have non-indigenous opponents. Alan Garcia's infamous remarks prompted disagreement from leading leftist politicians 
who accused the then president of racism and religious intolerance and defended the right of indigenous peoples to their spiritual beliefs. Yet, when these politicians joined the defense of what they called indigenous sacred mountains, the runakuna living in the surroundings of the endangered earth beings vacillated to consider the relations with Tirakuna's religion. Were, Tira, were Tirakuna sacred mountains? The answer was a certain, uncertain. Maybe, perhaps, but not only. As you may know, may now suspect, this was the moment I had in mind when I responded to that UK customs agent. Negative qualifiers at the site of denials, a negation of the negation, might may work as ethnographic tool to open possibility for the presence of what the imperative assertion of the given may either absent or impossible. What the Peruvian ex-president and his leftist opponents assert as indigenous religion, that is a relation between supernature and humans, inferior humans that don't have the right religion, those that lived around the endangered earth beings enacted not only as indigenous religion, that is, not only as a relation between, okay, nature and them. Their intervention, even if hesitant and subordinate, disobeyed the partition that came along with the conversion of Tiracuna and Runacuna into mountains and humans, and presented the relation between them intolerantly as superstition or tolerantly as worship of sacred mountains. The disobedience is a worlding event, a political anthropistemic opening performing Tiracuna with Runacuna and not only, for such composition is also humans and mountains. This is a complex assemblage. Each of the entities in these compositions and the worlding practices that make them is more than just one of them, inseparably so. Dorian Sagan and Donna Harrow would, would say that in this assemblage, humans are more than humans and nature is more than nature. And Mariano and Nazario would say yes, and not only. Included in the assemblage are Tiracuna with Runacuna. Another caveat, earth beings or the translation, their translation, the translation of earth beings into sacred mountains are not a requirement for the emergence of disobedient political relational processes where humans are not only such. In the northern Andes of Peru, a mining corporation wants to drain several lagoons to extract copper and gold. In exchange, they would build reservoirs, they say. Organized as guardians of the lagoon, local people defied the mine's intentions. Many have died in the process. Yet, I have not heard of the presence of earth beings once. Nevertheless, a relation of becoming with place may help think a situation that has been explained away as mere stubbornness. An icon iconic guardian of the lagoons is a peasant woman who plots the corporate mining project wants to buy to fully legalize its access to the territories it plans to excavate. The woman, whose name is Maxima, refuses to sell, and probably for an amount of money that she would otherwise never see in her lifetime. Countless times, the national police force hired by the mine has destroyed the family's crops, attacked her and her children, even her animals. Her responses as I asked her how she could stand it. Why did she stay? What? How can I be if I'm not this? The words with or land is not uttered. Instead, feet are stumped, breaking apart clouds of dried soul. This is who I am. How can I go? Like they, guards from the mine, pull out my potato plants. They will have to pull me out. Have you ever seen a potato plant pulling itself out? I cannot pull myself out. I will die. The word here is not uttered. Who I am with my bones, I will be once again. Here is not utter like I am. So Maxima is where what he is, or where Maxima is, is what 
she is. Like a potato plant, they'll have to pull her. Because she won't leave. Because like a potato plant, she cannot pull herself out of what she is. Through the lens of modern politics, this woman has been portrayed as an environmentalist and as an enemy or an ally, depending on who speaks. Both detractors and supporters use what I've been calling the grammar of conversion, albeit secularized. They separate maxima, the human, from land, natural resource, and then link both again through a relation, property or possession, legal or illegal. However, the refusal to sell may include another relation, one from where woman, land, lagoon, or plants, rocks, soils, animals, lagoons, humans, creeks, canals, become inherently together, an entanglement of entities needy of each other in such a way that pulled apart they would become something else. Conceived through this relation, the refusal to sell may also imply the refusal of the grammar that conceives entities as individual bodies, units of nature or the environment, which these entities are not when part of each other. There are no earth beings in Maxima's refusal. Nevertheless, like earth beings with Runaguna, her impossible separation from place also enacts what I've called uncommon nature, an assemblage of entities intra-becoming with each other and refracting individuation in such a way that translating them into units would require the use of force, literally so. Uncommon nature simultaneously, simultaneously coincides with, differs from, and exceeds, also because it is with humans, the object that the state, the mining corporation, and environmentalists translate into resources exploitable or to be defended. Thus, Maxima, she, stay, she stays because staying, she is. The redundancy reveals the relation where both place and Maxima emerge from one where she's not subject of the land, which is not her object. Her response exceeds the logic of profit and gain, certainly, and also that of the environment in its defense. If she is an environmentalist, and I think she is, she is not only such. When Maxima explains her being with the land in impossible detachment, their being together through with crops, rain, soil, animals, entities that make are the relation, this explanation, I propose, exceeds the limit of the property concept, where she, nevertheless, meets the mind in legal confrontation. Of course, her words can be heard to a habitual subject and object grammar. But her silences, which I have filled with words in brackets, also suggest that there is not only one grammar to her refusal to sell the land the mind wants. As a tool to perform onto epistemic openings, not only suggests that en not only suggests that entities or even the order of things may also be other than what it is, and entities other than what they also are. Not only is not a formula to add to a list, rather, not only opens room for presences that could challenge what we know, the ways we know it, and even suggest our impossibility of knowing without such impossibility cancelling those presences, because not only allows entities to both fall into each other and exceed each other, like the sacred mountain, mountain, and earth beings, whose overlaps and intra-excesses make me think, allowing for complex incommensurability not only in the other negativities, uncommons the anthropocene seen, inhabit the a-plural vocation of Thrithern's partial connections, more than one but less than many, yet not only, like Haraway's like Haraway cyborg, also works to indicate that a relation can be an entity, the partial connection as entity, not only the coming together of two distinct entities, human and mountain, or maxim and her land, also an entity that is not without the relation that makes it, an entity that is the relation that makes it. Maxima as an intra-relational becoming with what that which exceeds nature in humans and human because they become together. 
the guardians of the lagoon or ayu as an uncommon nature because it includes humans, which thus are not only such, a monstrous emergence that challenges usual categories and opens life to possibilities beyond those categories while also remaining with them, imploding taxonomies and also being with them, relentlessly, not only. Marisol, I'm, I'm really thrilled that we have the opportunity to meet today and to discuss some of the challenging and inspiring ideas that you've brought into view during your presentation. Uh, ideas which I believe help us advocate for uh, a radical reconstruction and decolonization of what it means to be human. So I'd like it for us to begin with a framing question uh, and sort of honoring the, the word, the glossary word for this week, human. Um, in your talk, you look at the Judeo-Christian emergence of the human as a concept and also how some authors, um, from Hortense's Pillars to Sylvia Winter to Foucault, um, have criticized it as being coterminous with um, the male legal rights holder, the heteronormative, white, propertied liberal subject that has been sort of um, exported as a universal constant. So Marisol, my question uh, would be whether there are versions of the human. And if so, can they be reconciled with the practices and becomings of earth beings? Absolutely. Yeah. And that's why I, I use the not only. I say human, yes. but not only. So okay. the not on, what the not only wants to do, it's a very powerful little phrase. Um, what the not only wants to do is to open this, open this event, that's the human, to beyond what it also is, meaning human. Yes, mm -hmm. runa kuna, of course, are human, but they are not the kind of human that we are, because you and I cannot be with rocks, or you and I cannot be like the yukahir, that becomes the elk only so far, because if that person, the yuka here person, loses sight of him or herself not being the elk, he or she is going to become the elk. It's unimaginable for me to think that possibility. That's not the human I am. So I think yuka here is human indeed, but not only. There's another person in the yucca here, and that person is not the human that was imposed on the yucca here. So I also use the, pers the word person. Man, that's a Foucauldian term that we have all inherited, and we talk about the emergence of man, right, as a modern invention. And this is the heteropatriarchal um, white male. But that figure emerges from human. Where does the figure of human emerge from? How does it emerge? That's my question. Okay. And at, at, what practices are canceled so that that human can emerge? What practices is that human capable of so that that human can emerge? So it's enabling of the human and a disabling of a different kind of person that that human cannot be. Cannot be because he or she is a creature of God, mm -hmm. or they, uh, there's a lot of heteronormativity there too. Uh, and a lot of early uh, species making, uh, I haven't explored that, but there's this possibility of persons becoming Jaguars, for example, that Eduardo Kahn talks about, or lions like that Harry West talks about. Um, that's uh, Eduardo calls it 
trans species or pigeon trans tra pigeon species or pigeon trans species or so, something like that. I cannot remember the uh, Eduardo's exact words. And I think yes, but that's also the species being is also or the species making is also um, sexing uh, that person uh, for a certain kind of uh, populating of worlds that may not have been there uh, when persons are before the human or are human and not only. So yes, I completely, yes, the human, of course, the human is there, but then not only opens it up to what the human cannot be. And these persons are. Marisol, thank you so much for uh, that answer. And um, because our time is short today, um, I'd like to ask a sort of threefold question. Uh, and it starts by thinking whether uh, the ability to reconcile the human with its success, with the not only um, with it being politically promising, as you mentioned. Um, and I wonder whether this could be operationalized across different political contexts, specifically across market-driven capitalist ideologies. The second question would then be that considering that colonialism, capitalism and hate patriarchy are governing frameworks for feelings of estrangement, of unbelonging, be it from ourselves, from nature, from others. Um, is the human not only a spatial and temporal opening um, and whether this notion might contribute to current discussions on, uh, on time, on locality, on globality? And finally, a third question, uh, why is it important to talk about worlds and futures in the plural? Worlds and futures in the plural and not only, right? Uh, because these worlds and futures are not like billiard balls separated from each other. So there is, um, there's multiplicity, there's the multiple, but at the same time, there's a connection that makes it one, but it makes a different one. It, it doesn't make a one that's a unit. It makes a fractal one. It makes a, a, a one that's like Manning Strathern, uh, echoing Donna Haraway, uh, says more than one, less than many. And the more than one, less than many expresses this fractality of the connection. And at the same time, it makes, it talks about the connection. So, okay, that said, uh, that, that is uh, regard, it's in regards to plurality. Why is it important to talk about more than one, less than many? If we are embarked in decolonizing practices, not only of thought, but of living, not only of thought, but bodily practices. I think that we have to start from thinking, and I'm not saying recognizing, because we can only recognize what we recognize. We have to start from thinking that what we know and how we know doesn't exhaust what can be. Doesn't exhaust what can be and what is, but has been made impossible. And because it has been made impossible, it is also not. But, and that's why we cannot recognize it because it is also not. But the fact that we cannot recognize it, the fact that we cannot know it, doesn't mean it is not. So I think a, a starting point 
to think like that, to think that there is something that has been impossible, but impossible, but is requires thinking about more than one, less than many, requires thinking about the multiple, requires thinking about worlds and futures, and maybe ways in which futures are world, meaning not linearly, meaning uh, not from a past, maybe as past, uh, but also as present, it alters. And this goes back to your second question, the idea of time and place. It alters the way we think time. We don't think it linearly. It alters the way we think place. We, are, we may be forced to think time and place simultaneously as in the phrase taking place. When something takes place, there's something and there's place. It occurs, place and something occur simultaneously. Simultaneity of time and uh, place and collapsing of moments into that taking place. So um, I think I need to tell you where I'm coming from. Um, and I am coming from the absolute empirical, an empirical that I could not understand, uh, an empirical that I was exposed to that escaped the empirical itself. So it was an experience. My empirical experience was one in which what was supposed to be so that I could understand what was, what was supposed to be in front of my eyes, of my senses, so that I could start thinking about it was not because I couldn't, I couldn't fathom it. And that was the notion of I. One of the notions that I first started thinking with was the notion of I you the A-Y-L-L-U, uh, that is the simultaneous taking place of earth beings and runa kuna, simultaneous taking place of what I called humans and mountains. How that does happen? So that disarticulated all the elements that I had to think. It made me think these people are not just like me, they are with earth beings that I don't know what they are. So these empirical elements that I was being offered to think with disappeared as empirical and emerged some only as possibilities, not as abstractions. It was not abstract. It was a possibility of being that I could not grasp. It was a uh, it was not an empirical, it exceeded the empirical, but it was not abstract. It was. It was to the point that I was told, can't you see it? Can't you feel it? And no, I can't. Okay, so uh, it was an embodied experience of difference, of relational difference. I could not relate. I could not become like my friends related, like my friends became. So um, going back to, um, or connecting these to your first question. Yes, um, I think that this um, way of thinking, this proposal to think is a proposal that's not, Yes, I was, I was inspired to think about it uh, with friends that the Peruvian state classifies as indigenous and who call themselves Runa Cuna. But it's not intended only 
as emergences from that which is devoid of capitalism. Uh, the places where I thought from were being destroyed by mining corporations. And I think that it was precisely the historical moment when the capacity to destroy what the early colonial missionaries could not destroy, meaning when mining could destroy earth beings, that I was required to think that earth beings were mountains and not only. I couldn't, I couldn't, it was this very historical moment of capitalism, neoliberal opening of territories to capitalist destruction for capitalist production, indeed, that made me think what is being destroyed is not just mountains. The protest that we are witnessing here is not just a protest for the environment, in defense of the environment. It is a process that's also motivated by the need to be with earth beings. So yes, it is, it is a very historical proposal that I'm making or a, a proposal made at a very specific historical moment uh, without which, out of which I wouldn't have been able to think this proposal that includes the um, request to think beyond history, to think the ahistorical, and that I think has the capacity to travel, this request to think beyond history, to think the ahistorical, as it is part of history without being accepted by history. I think this request um, is an abstract proposal that was inspired through a very concrete empirical situation, but it has the capacity to travel, uh, but it also has the requirement to be placed again. So you can think the ahistorical as being made with, with history without history allowing it. That you can think. How that happens needs to be thought in place. How that happens has to be placed. Um, <clears throat> I think that destruction of what we call nature, and which I think is not only nature, happens everywhere uh, right now. And it has happened everywhere since, um, I don't know, since the, uh, let's say, since the late 15th, 16th century, when the one world, world started to become what we know now. Uh, so it has not, it does not just happen in remoteness where uh, humans are humans, but not only, and therefore are able to call that into our attention. I think that if we pay attention, that destruction is happening everywhere. And that destruction is destruction of nature. But I don't think you need to find earth beings to think nature and not only. Um, earth beings is how I started to think about nature and not only. Eduardo Viveiros started thinking multinaturalism um, in the Amazon. Uh, but the ways the proposal is to think beyond the established notions, not to do away with them, but to think about them as events, as historical events, notions as historical events, and then think about how those historical events that are notions are not only what they also are, because they are definitely hegemonic. We cannot think without them, but we can think about them with not only. And that's open, open them up to what they also are not. 
Thank you, Marisol. It's been uh, what a what a wonderful pleasure to be able to share uh, this moment. I'll, I'll be brief with you. Um, you have, you've you've uh, laid out a very thought provoking reflection, both in your talk and in this short round of questions and answers, um, which is asking us to uh, think at the disjuncture of time and space, uh, in the betwixt and between of human, of nature, uh, of worlds and futures, um, and what these discussions afford to political debates around visibility and representation is both extremely challenging and, and re-energizing. Um, so we're very grateful for uh, telling us uh, about ways of attuning to the practices of the runa kuna, uh, about how um, exposing political concepts such as human nature might open up new political programs. And indeed, learning uh, from your long-standing work in the Andes is, uh, I believe, or it reverberates uh, much beyond. Um, so the ways in which um, you have been working towards decolonizing life and thought are extremely inspirational, and uh, we're really grateful for um, the possibility for you to join us today. Uh, and also grateful for our viewers for tuning in. Um, next week we'll be doing a live with queer theorist Jack Alverstam on the topic of wellness, uh, which we hope you can join. Stay tuned and thank you very much for connecting with us today.